Hi everybody, this is Professor Paul Hicks talking to you about philosophy again. Uh, today we're going to talk about Plato's Apology. This is the defense of Socrates. Now when we talk about the word apology, we're not saying, oh, I'm sorry that I did something wrong. That's not what the apology means here. Uh, when we mean apology, in, at least in philosophy, what we're saying is not only did I not do anything wrong, I did something right and I'm going to prove it to you. So really what we have is a defense of Socrates. All right. Now, um, let's think about what Socrates was. He was certainly one of the main, the main character in all of Plato's dialogues. If you read the Republic, the, the uh, Euthyphro, or any of his other dialogues, you'll see Socrates. Uh, Socrates was Plato's teacher. Socrates lived about 469 to 399 BCE. Most of what we know of him comes from Plato, since he is the main character of the dialogues. However, there are other sources about Socrates' life. Uh, for example, the Greek playwright Aristophanes talked about Socrates. The historian Xenophon talked about Socrates. In fact, Xenophon actually has uh, wrote down another, um, I guess, transcript of this trial. And it matches very closely to the one that Plato has. And so what we believe is that this trial really did happen. There really was a Socrates. There really, he really was put on trial. And you know, all of this really did happen. So let's kind of get into this just a little bit to understand um, you know, what this trial is. So let's go ahead and set the setting of this. Um, uh, so here's how the trials worked back in ancient Athens. You would have somebody, they didn't have you know, district attorneys back then, they didn't have lawyers in the way that we have it, they didn't have anything of that sort. So if you committed a crime, if you did something wrong, uh, somebody could charge you. A citizen of Athens would simply charge you. And they would say, I think Socrates did X. And then what would happen, they would go to court. And in the court, what would happen is they would have a big bottle of water with a, with a hole in the bottom. And when all of the water drained from this big jug uh, into this other jug on the bottom, that was your time was up. And so the prosecutor, that is the people who actually accused, in this case, Socrates, uh, of whatever crime, uh, they had a very limited amount of time to actually present their case. Socrates then would come up, or the defendant, and uh, the same thing. He also had a very limited amount of time to present that case. Then what would happen is that there would be a jury. Now, the jury would be of 500 people, right? Not the 12 jury, uh, 12 person jury we have today, um, but about 500 people would be, actually be the jury, and they didn't need to get uh, unanimous. They only had to get um, a majority of those votes, and whoever won the majority of the vote won the actual case. Now, after the case, if, uh, say, for example, Socrates lose, which we'll talk about in a bit, uh, then there's going to be what's called the penalty phase, right? And in the penalty phase, this is where each that is the defendant, the person being accused, having already been found guilty, has an opportunity to present an appropriate punishment for the crime that they were found guilty of. And of course, the prosecutor, um, whoever was charging, in this case Socrates, has to present a, an appropriate punishment for the crime that they were found guilty of. And the jury would choose from one of those two. They couldn't just make up their own. They had to choose from either the punishment put forward by the prosecutor or by the defendant. All right. And so this is essentially, you know, jurisprudence in ancient Athens. Okay. So let's go ahead and um, and get into this a little bit. So in order to understand also the what's going on in Socrates in the Apology. Um, you need to understand the sophist, because Socrates is accused of being a sophist. Now, you think sophist comes from the, the word sophia of wisdom, and you would think that the sophists would be the wise ones. Well, the sophists were essentially these people who were pretty intellectual. Um, they would go around and they would teach for money. Um, one of the things that they would do would be they'd teach rhetoric, that is, how to actually argue, how to present a particular position so that you would win. Well, what would happen um, when they would do something like this is that they were seen as just taking any position 
so that they win, not trying to get after some sort of truth, but just trying to prove a particular position. And they would do it for a fee. So you can think of, say, the sofas maybe as some of our modern day attorneys in this particular sense, right? That a lawyer doesn't really care if you're guilty or not. Their job is to present your case for a fee, right? And so what they say may or may not be true, uh, it's really done for the money, all right? Now, you could think about how lawyers have, say, maybe a bad reputation in our society. The Sophists had a pretty bad reputation back then, especially in the 5th century uh, Athens, uh, BCE. All right? So, um, when Socrates is accused of being a Sophist, this is, this is something that he takes great offense to, because he never actually took money, and he was actually after the truth. He wasn't just arguing for the sake of argument. He had good reasons for this. All right? Uh, and so... Uh, and in the apology when he's accused of being a sophist, this is this is really, you know, I guess I want to say hurtful to him, but uh, he, he doesn't like it, right? This is not who he is. Um, Socrates in the apology seems intent on antagonizing the judges, the jury, not only in showing that his accusers don't know what they're talking about, but he talks about himself as being a gadfly. A gadfly is a stinging fly, and what it was known to do was really to, to, to um, sting the rear end, or the ass, of a horse. All right, This is going to be important in order to understand Socrates' uh, position later. Um, Socrates believed that virtue was a kind of knowledge, and that if you knew the virtue, um, you would seek virtue. Right? If you knew virtue, you would seek virtue. It would be something that you would just, you would focus your entire energy on obtaining. You would pursue it. The problem was that many of the Athenian elite have mistaken what virtue actually is. They thought of it as being, say, wealth or material goods or military strength. And they thought this was the key to happiness. Where Socrates thought knowledge and, and, and virtue, good living and justice and being a just person, that was the key to happiness. And so you have a very different... Uh, side. So um, he's on trial for his life. And so let's get into the uh, other characters here. There were three people who were to prosecute Socrates. You had uh, Anitis, you had Miletus, and you had Lycone. The only one that's actually going to be speaking, though, in the apology is going to be Miletus. All right. Now he is charged with corrupting the youth and not believing in the gods of the state or ultimately being an atheist. This was a very dangerous charge, as it has been throughout all of history, really. Uh, being an atheist is a very, very, very dangerous position to take in uh, certain parts of history and certain parts of this world. And so to be charged with that was a very serious, serious crime. So um, Socrates argues that the reason these accusations have been made against him is not that they're actually true, but rather that he has earned a bad reputation. So as to the charge, he's been told that of being wise. Socrates tells a story of a friend of his that went to the oracle at Delphi. Now keep in mind, this story has also been confirmed through Xenophon as well. Uh, and so we really do think that this actually did occur. Now let's talk about what an oracle at Delphi actually was. So the Greeks believed in multiple gods, and each god had what was called an oracle. And you can go to the oracle, and you can ask a question of the god. The oracle was considered to be the mouthpiece of that particular god. Now, the top god in Greek mythology was Zeus, and the oracle at Delphi was the mouthpiece for Zeus. And so whatever the oracle said is to be understood as Zeus actually saying it. And so it really can't be argued against. It's just you need to accept it as being true. And so when one of his friends goes to the oracle at Delphi, they are, this person asks, the oracle, who is the wisest person of all? And the oracle comes back and says, Socrates. Now this is shocking to Socrates because he didn't think of himself as wise at all. In fact, the, you know, he very famously says that the one thing I know is I don't know anything at all. Um, and so this idea now that God or the oracle is saying that Socrates is the wisest, this is shocking to Socrates. And he goes and is set 
to prove the oracle wrong because he can't possibly be the wisest. He says, I don't know anything, so how could I be the wisest? Uh, he's convinced that the oracle wouldn't lie, but he thinks he could try to prove the oracle wrong and maybe that there's some sort of mistake that was actually made here. Or there's some sort of misunderstanding that's going on. And so he sets out on a mission to find somebody who's wiser than he is, and in doing so, he will be able to prove the oracle wrong. Um, well, let's see if he's actually um, able to do that. So Socrates sets out to talk with those who have the reputation of being wise, people that are considered to be wise. So you have politicians are supposed to be wise. Um, but then he goes up to the politicians, and he starts to debate them. And he does this, by the way, in public. And Socrates happened to have a, a group of younger people that would follow him and watch as he really proves to these people who think that they're wise that they're not wise at all. And so the politicians, he goes to the politicians first, and he, he says, well, you're wise, so please tell me what wisdom is. Uh, and what he finds out is that these politicians just say things that aren't actually true. They don't even care what the truth is. And so what he determines is that these people aren't wise. They don't know anything, but they think that they're wise. Right? This is going to become important where they think that they're wise, and they're not actually wise. Uh, and so Socrates uh, gives up on the politicians. Uh, the politicians, of course, get mad at him uh, because he's making them look like fools in public, and they, of course, don't like that. Um, and so he determines that, you know, these politicians, they think they're wise, but they're not wise. Where he says, I know I'm not wise. But insofar that I know I'm not wise, I know that I'm wiser than the politicians because I know I'm not wise, and that in and of, of itself makes me wiser than they are. All right, so next he goes to the poets and the artists, and he discovers that you know, they, talk with, they speak with great eloquence, but they have no substance to what they're saying. Next he goes to the artists, and he finds that they believe that they're knowledgeable of the craft, that they're able to you know, talk some great truths. But he also finds that, geez, they don't seem to be very knowledgeable about important matters either. And yet all of these people think that they're wise. And other people look at them and think that they're wise. And Socrates goes about proving they're in fact not wise at all. But every single one of them thinks they're wise when they're not wise. Where Socrates says, I'm not wise, but I know I'm not wise. And since I know that I'm not wise. I'm wiser than they are because I know I'm not wise in the first place. All right? Does that make sense? Um, so in his attempt to go prove the oracle wrong or mistaken, um, Socrates is going around Athens, and he's going to the very powerful and to the very famous. And he is doing what? He's making them look like fools. And the young people that are following Socrates starts to laugh at them. Now, the young people... Um, watching Socrates, they would start to imitate Socrates, and they would also go to people and, you know, show that they're in fact not wise and make fools of them, right? So he, he develops this sort of following. And so he now comes to this acceptance that, you know what, the oracle was in fact right. Socrates truly is the wisest person. And how do we know this? Because, once again, he is the one person that says he's not wise, so, right, where all of the other people say that they are in fact wise, but they're not really. So Socrates and his knowledge that he's not wise is in fact wiser than they are. All right. Um, so look, he's making a lot of enemies by doing this, right? So, um, all right. So let's get into the actual defense here. So Miletus has uh, provided... Uh, a, an argument to prosecute Socrates. We're not going to get into that. We're just going to look at uh, the defense of Socrates. So Socrates moves to the accuser, Miletus, and Miletus accuses him of corrupting the youth. So since Miletus is concerned that Socrates is corrupting the youth, Socrates argues Miletus must be therefore concerned about the improvement of the youth. Right? Obviously, if you are against me because I, you think that I corrupt the youth, you must be concerned about the improvement of the youth, right? That just stands to reason. All right, so he asked Miletus, you know, Miletus um, 
If, in fact, you are really concerned about improving the youth, you must know who improves the youth. If you know that I'm the type of person, at least from your position, that doesn't improve the youth, who really improves the youth? And so what do you think Miletus does? He looks to the jury and he says, they do. They, the judges who are judging this case, the senators, the citizen assembly, the people of Athens, right? They are improvers of the youth. Everybody else is the improver of the youth, but you, Socrates, and you alone corrupt the youth. Um, so what's happening here? So Miletus is appealing to the audience. He's trying to get the jury on their side. He's talking wonderful and great things about them as if, you know, they really are the improvers of the youth. Um, so everything he says is very positive towards them. Notice here, who do you think the real sophist is? Right? Who's making an argument for the seeking of truth rather than making an argument to make themselves look good? Right? Miletus appears to be really the true sophist here. Socrates then gets Miletus to say that everybody improves the youth and that Socrates alone is the lone corrupter. Uh, Socrates then goes into this horse training analogy where he says that um, who does good to horses? Is it the majority of people or the minority of people? It seems to be that the majority of people don't know anything about horses, but the one that is trained to take care of horses does good to the horses. And so, therefore, the minority of people are the ones that do good to horses, and the majority do not. Uh, he thinks this is somehow analogous here. Maybe you can kind of look at this as part of the forms, uh, you know, that Plato has talked about in other dialogues. Um, but he thinks that, you know, he's proven here that if the minority is the one that's good for horses and the majority is bad for horses, then it must also be the case that the minority is the one that improves the youth and the majority does not improve the youth. And this is his argument against Miletus. Um, and then Miletus goes on and argues, well, the good do their neighbors good and that evils do their neighbors evil. So Socrates now tries to get Miletus to commit to believing that he intentionally does harm to his neighbors, which in turn would then harm him back. Now, of course, he thinks this is a silly, since Socrates is also accused of being wise. Shouldn't he know that to harm his neighbor would only bring harm back? Would a wise man really do such a thing? I mean, we established, I mean, that Socrates is wise. So would a wise man do that? Socrates doesn't think so. And so he, he thinks that this is a good defense against uh, Miletus. Um, the only other option, of course, is that if Socrates did this harming, but he did it unintentionally. Now, this is important because back in Athenian jurisprudence, if you did something unintentionally, you're not to be punished for it, really, but rather you're to be instructed to not to do it again. And so what's important is that Miletus has to stick to the line that Socrates is doing this intentionally. All right? Um, now, Socrates moves on, and he tries to go to the other uh, particular um, charge. So Miletus then argues that Socrates doesn't believe in any gods of the state. And so Socrates asks, well, do, you, do I not just believe in the gods of the state, or do I not believe in any gods at all? And Miletus says, Socrates, you are an atheist. You don't believe in any gods whatsoever. But he does tend to say that he's... Socrates is trying to get these young people to believe in other gods. Well, if he's trying to get these other people to believe in other gods, is that because Socrates believes in those gods? And so now what we have is that Socrates believes in some gods, but does not believe, but Miletus is saying he believes in no gods. And so we have a contradiction here, right? And so what Socrates does is gets Miletus to say that, hey, I do believe in some gods, Um and he gets Miletus to contradict himself, right? Because Miletus says, well, you believe in these God things, but not gods. And Socrates says, what are you talking about? Believe in God things, but not gods. That would be, he says, akin to saying, I believe in flute playing, but there's no such thing as a flute player. What would that mean? That seems completely absurd. Because um, Miletus is saying that Socrates is a, is teaching them, the young people, to believe in divine things, but not in the divine. And this, of course, is an absurdity, 
right? It's a contradiction. And so Socrates thinks that he makes Miletus look ignorant and foolish. Uh, as to the charge of corrupting the youth, Socrates shows all of the supposed victims, all of these youth that he supposedly corrupted and made worse off, he says, what side of the court are they on? You notice they're all supporting and give all of their support to Socrates. So if Socrates really harmed them, why are these people who have been harmed by Socrates supporting Socrates? And Miletus essentially says, well, they've been brainwashed. Okay, fine. Let's say that the youth really have been brainwashed. Uh, brainwashed excuse me. Well, then their families would recognize that they've been brainwashed and that they're being harmed. And the families would then go and want to prosecute Socrates. But Socrates says, wait a second. They're all on my side, too. So am I really corrupting the youth? And so what ends up happening is he gives these arguments, and he thinks he's, he's successful against Miletus. Um, and he proves Miletus to just to be a complete fool. But after proving Miletus to be a fool, he says this. And this is really uh, what Socrates thinks of why he's on trial. He says, I certainly have many enemies, and this is what will be my destruction if I am destroyed. Of that I am certain, not Miletus, nor yet Anitus, but the envy and detraction of the world, which has been the death of many good men, and will probably be the death of many more. There is no danger of my being the last of them. All right? So Socrates recognized that, uh, you know, these people, the majority of people, who are not wise, and in fact dangerous, really. I mean, we'll talk about this in, in other dialogues like the Credo. Um, they find out that, uh, you know, they hate Socrates because of what he's doing, and this is what's going to destroy him. It's the fact that he's, he's being an intellect, right? He's being intellectual, and he's attempting to find truth. And this, of course, goes against the supposed truth that all of the, his detractors actually believe in. So Socrates then hopes to prove but the reason he has done what he's done, rather than to go against Zeus and to go against God, was really to um, honor God, was to really honor Zeus. And if this is true, he says he is, in fact, more pious than Miletus is. So he says that he's always tried to do what was right. He always tried to do what was just, even in overwhelming opposition. He's doing this to answer the idea that he's somehow crazy for not just giving in to the accusation so he can be set free, which is what most people would in fact do. Socrates, though, is trying to show that it's more important to do what is just than what is profitable. It doesn't matter. He doesn't care about the consequences of this particular trial. He cares more about being just and doing the right thing no matter what. So he argues he did not run uh, when he was in war. He followed his officers. He didn't disobey his commanders, which would, of course, have been wrong. This, of course, would have been open to being harmed, but he, he was courageous and he did it anyways. Shouldn't the same hold true for following orders from God? If you're going to follow orders from your military commanders, wouldn't following orders from God be even more important? Um, also, he says, you know, we really shouldn't fear what might happen. We're not going to fear death because... Um, Right? Remember Socrates, the oracle told Socrates he's the wisest of them all. And he's come to accept this as, so far as that he's not wise, that he's wiser than everybody else. But to fear death, according to Socrates, is to say that you know what death is like. You have something to fear. But he says, you don't know what death is like. None of us know what death is like. So why should we be afraid of it? Maybe death's a wonderful thing. We don't know. Um... He argues that anybody who accuses him of being crazy should really be ashamed of themselves because here he is making Athens better by caring more about wisdom and truth and the improvement of the soul when everybody else just cared about money, honor, and their reputations. He's made a lot of enemies, but he says, you know what? I am a stinging gadfly. Right? He, has, he says, as he sees it, he goes around Athens teaching people to care more about improving their soul over improving their reputations and finances. And this is all he has done. He's trying to improve people. He's trying to improve Athens. This is all he has done and is therefore not a danger to Athens, but more of a hero. Think about the gadfly comment here for just a bit. So what is the gadfly? So Socrates is arguing that he's stinging Athens to try to be better. 
And this is annoying to Athens. But he is in trying to make Athens better. And so he says he is the gadfly. Now, remember, who is the jury? These are made up of citizens, right? Um, these are Athenians. Um, so if he's the gadfly, and the gadfly is known for the stinging the ass of a horse, what is he calling the people of Athens? He's calling them a horse's ass. You know, Socrates, you know, he doesn't show any real fear. And, you know, he kind of comes in rather arrogant and... You know, he just doesn't care. He just doesn't care about this stuff. He's not going to grovel for his life, and these people think that they ought to. He says, that would be demeaning to me, and it would not be on the side of justice. And if it's not on the side of justice, it's not on the side of God. Uh, he argues that if he was to grovel for his life, he would be going against God. He would be putting the jury's opinion before the opinion of God. And if he did this, then he would be found guilty of the charges he is accused of. But since he is not guilty of these charges... He will not grovel. So what do you think happens? He insults the jury. Um, he of a jury that's already against him because he has this bad reputation of making everyone look foolish. Uh, he's an antagonizer. Um, Socrates is found guilty. All right. Uh, he was approximately, we don't know this from Plato's Apology, but we do from Xenophon. It was something around 280 people that said he was guilty, and about 220 said he was not guilty, right? So if, if it went, say, like 30 <laughs> of jurors the other way, Socrates would have been set free, and he would have been found innocent. All right, so Socrates is now found guilty. Um, he now has to start the penalty phase of the trial. And so Miletus goes to Socrates, or to the jury, and he says, you know what, the only punishment that Socrates should have here is he's such a horrible person. He's done such harm. He should be sentenced to death, right? Sentenced to death for not believing in the great God and for corrupting the youth. Well, um, Socrates says, okay. So now remember, Socrates has to now propose a punishment, which can only be chosen between the one that he chooses and the one that Miletus does. So Socrates could propose, say, a fine, for example. He could oppose, uh, propose banishment. He could, he could propose all sorts of things. And um, the jury probably would have gone for it. But he doesn't. Rather, he says, what I am due. What is it that I am due for what it is that I have done? He says, I haven't done any harm. In fact, I've made Athens better. So what should my punishment be for this? He says, you should take care of me and my family for the rest of my life. You should put us up in, uh, in a nice home. You should feed us. And you should, in a sense, take care of him and his family. Rather than proposing a punishment, Socrates is proposing a reward. So now we have a punishment of death or an absolute reward. This is the only two that the jury can have. Now, the jury already found him guilty, so they're not likely to give him the reward of what he thinks he's due, right? So, um, he says, well, let's look at other possibilities. Let's look at exile. He says, should I consider exile? But he realizes that if he does, they'll just allow him to live and just exile him. But in fact, why would he want to be exiled? He actually says, I would prefer death to exile, for if I'm exiled, he says, I'm just going to do the same thing in a new city-state, and I'm going to end up in the same position with that new city-state who's going to want to exile him or imprison him. And so he says, I'm not going to consider a punishment because I don't think I deserve one. This is, you know, maybe just think about this. He could propose anything of a punishment, a fine, anything. And he says, I'm not going to do that because I don't, that's not what to do. I'm on the side of God. I will do what is right. And I don't care what the majority of people think. I will be on the side of God and on the side of justice. Um, all right. So the jury, of course, chooses the punishment set forth by Miletus. And they sentence Socrates to death. Um, Socrates goes on to explain that it's not him. It's not Socrates who's going to be seen as evil. But it's going to be those that condemned him. 
I mean, if you think about it now, here we are 2,500 years later. Nobody cares about Miletus and Anitus. They care about Socrates. Socrates is the hero. Socrates is the good one. And the accusers are considered the bad ones. And he says that this is the case because I am on the side of righteousness that people will, honor, will end up respecting me. Um, so, you know, these people are now saying, you know, Socrates, what about death? You're going to be sentenced to death. You're going to die. How do you feel about that? And Socrates puts forward a little bit of a view of death here. And he says, let's take a look at what all the possibilities that death might be. He says, one, one thing that death might be, is it might be just pure annihilation. That is, there's just no consciousness. You just cease to exist. And Socrates says, well, what's wrong with that? I'm not, I'm not afraid of that. If, you know, if, I, if I'm annihilated and cease to exist, I don't know that I'm annihilated and ceasing to exist, so there's nothing to actually fear. Uh, second, he says, maybe death is like a deep sleep. Right? Maybe you just go to sleep forever. And he says, but who doesn't love sleep? I mean, isn't sleeping wonderful? And so maybe if death is like sleep, he says, there's nothing to fear there. And then, of course, uh, Socrates says, you know, maybe there's an afterlife. Maybe what the uh, mythology, the Greek mythology is correct, that there's a Hades, and he will go and hang out with all the people that he's loved, his family and friends that have passed, and he'll be able to go and speak to the great minds uh, that have died. And he says, that's wonderful. He says, I have nothing to fear there as well. And he says, you know, rather than harming me, you don't realize you've actually benefited me by sentencing me to death. And Socrates says, death is better for me. And unfortunately for the accusers, you're actually helping rather than harming. All right, and then Socrates essentially ends um, before leaving the, uh, the court. He walks away and he says this. He says, the hour of departure has arrived, and we go our separate ways, I to die and you to live. But which of these two is better? Only God knows. All right? So there's the apology in a nutshell. Um, it's a pretty easy read. Uh, like I said, we think this actually did happen. There really was a Socrates, and this really did occur. And in fact, he really was sentenced to death. So I'm going to go ahead and we'll end the apology here. We're going to pick it up with the credo uh, where Socrates is then in prison. So the next video for you to watch would be the credo. All right, everybody, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me, um, uh, and I will uh, talk to you all soon. All right, have a good day.